when you walk in the holy fear of God, all of a sudden the Bible comes together. Yeah. It's, it's the beginning of understanding. Hey everybody, it's Thursday. If you're watching this on Thursday, which is when we release this every two weeks on Thursday, we are back with John Bevere. I read his book, it blessed me. I asked him to come on. This interview was crazy. It's a quick one, but a lot of info is given. You're gonna love it. Hit like, hit, hit subscribe, uh, leave a comment. You know what to do. And hey, in like four days, we have our online mission school starting. Sign up, the information's below. Enjoy this incredible conversation with John Bevere. First of all, thank you so much for coming. It's good to be here. I mean, I love you. I love what you do for uh, Heidi. We we uh, It was an honor to have you out at our family gathering. And that was still, so amazing. I don't know if you can see over on the walls over there. We uh, You gave us a word about like expansion and multiplication. I just finished in this room with um, our leaders, flew them in, our, our whole expansion plan wow. for this next coming season. So thank you. And we actually read through some of those words. It was amazing. The effect that you had on our team was, was that's, awesome. That's and amazing. the word the word that you carried. So thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. I have been... Thank God. It, it, it was amazing. I've been a fanboy for years, so this is a little surreal. Um, and I know we've met before, but I I saw you in an airport once. And I, I was remember. so nervous I to come I up remember. and see. I was so nervous. I didn't. I've kicked myself for years. Okay, so I'm just a brother and a friend. I know. Serving Jesus Listen, like you. I so totally get it. level of playing field. I totally get it, but, okay. I, but, I, but I need to say that so I stop acting weird. <laughs> Uh, but honestly, the impact you're you've very had. kind, and I take that as a very kind statement, honoring statement. But yeah, we're we're just both brothers serving Jesus. Come on, yeah. But the impact that you've had, uh, the bait of Satan, I read years ago, just touched my life, touched my heart, like in such a in such a beautiful way. So the fact that you get to be here, listen, we can cover a lot of ground, and I, and I want to do that as fast okay. as we can because I know you have a limited amount of time today. Yeah. Um. So I'm going to jump right in. Okay. Because I have been devouring your book. The Awe of God? Yes. Okay. And when I say devouring, okay. Wow. Yes. It's spectacular. And I don't even do this to books. I don't. This is spectacular. Wow. What, what caused you? Uh, okay. Anybody that watches this podcast, they know I don't have anybody on to pitch anything. So I wanted you to come on. Oh my god! So we could talk I'm, about. I'm this. just blown away because it's just I just have my friends on, but getting this book, reading it, understanding, uh, getting understanding the message a little bit more. It's in here. I, I actually don't think there is a more timely word. Well, I will say this: um, this is the 24th book I've written, <laughs> and you know, Beta Satan passed six million last September. Yeah. This one has far outperformed any book. Now, I'm saying that not as a businessman, yeah. not as a salesman. I'm saying that because I believe it's the word of God for this coming season. Yeah. In 1990, God spoke to me and he said, son, the next move of my spirit that will blanket the United States. Now, let's let's talk. I know re revival or I know Brownsville happened. Yep. I know uh, Toronto happened. Yep. But the last move of God that blanketed our nation was the Jesus Revolution. Right. I got saved at the very end of it. Okay. In that move, God revealed, and I didn't realize this until what he spoke to me in 1990. In that move, God revealed that he was our daddy. Yeah. And the people that were greatly impacted were the hippies. Mm -hmm. All right. We found out our God is our dad and he loves us. The next move, God told me, in 1990, he told me this, the next move of his spirit is going to blanket America yeah. is going to be a move of the holy awe of God, the holy fear, healthy fear mm -hmm. of God. Now, why is that? I'm going to tell you why I personally believe that. I believe that there's only one thing that produces holiness, authentic holiness. Yeah. Now, when I say that word, people get scared. Why? Because legalism, yep. legalists want to beat us up and control our behavior. That's not holiness. Yeah. Some people see it as dull and boring. That's not true because C.S. Lewis says, if you see holiness as dull, you haven't experienced the real deal. Right. It's irresistible. Right. Holiness isn't an end to itself. It's a doorway into intimacy with God. So the legalist will make it an end to itself. Right. All right? We understand that it is the doorway into a very intimate relationship with God. Paul made it so clear 
in the New Testament that holiness is perfected in the fear of the Lord two times. He said in 2 Corinthians 7, having the promise of God dwelling in us in his glory, let us cleanse ourselves. Yeah. He doesn't say the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse us. Now, the blood of Jesus cleanses me. Yep. That's justification. That's, yep. not, that's our gift of salvation we cannot earn. Mm-hmm. But sanctification begins the day we are justified. That's when what's in us is worked out. Right. And Paul said we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. In Philippians, not love and kindness. But then he also says in 2 Corinthians, having the promise of his glory dwelling in us and among us, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear or the healthy fear of God. Yeah. So the fear of God is not to be scared of God. It's actually being terrified of being away from him. Right. It's actually what Jesus delighted in. Now that gets my attention. <laughs> Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. Yeah. Then God in Isaiah 33 verse 6, and, and by the way, that was Isaiah 11, 3. Isaiah 11, 36 says excuse me, 11.6 says that the fear of the Lord is God's treasure. Mm-hmm. So think about it. God's treasure, Jesus' delight, and it's what matures our salvation. Yeah. Wow, why aren't we talking about right. this a whole lot more? Uh, as, I, as I have gone deep, I mean, I read, another, I read another 60, 70 pages just this morning, the first, the first part again, just because I wanted to make sure I, I got it. You are tackling something that is, I, th- I think a lot of people, let's say maybe uh, in their early 20s, they're new in, in faith. They don't have a concept of this unless you've had some of the experiences which you, sh- which you talk about in here, the Brazil and Malaysia, um, where the presence of God came in. And it was beautiful and, and, and terrifying, terrifying mm-hmm. at the exact same time. But I've, yet you're drawn to it. Right. But and I've ahead. had some of those. Like, I know that yes. feeling. Yep. So when you read, when you read it in, in the Word, it's hard to maybe connect all the points and and this is the first thing i've read where you there's so many it, you you put all the points where it says fear and you know and trembling all together you mapped it out really beautifully how do you i think one of the issues is let me let me get my question right one of the issues is when you read it as it is that it that it doesn't really equate to what you're writing about like i i does that make sense gosh why am i butchering this no, you're doing as great. you no I, as you as you as you read about the fear of the Lord, it it you don't get the sense. I don't get the sense of this like beautiful awe, wonderful. <sighs> really, until you defined awe, I think I think that was a key point for me in the book. Of so so talk to me about the process so, of you defining awe. So okay, here's here's where we run into an issue that I think is very relevant, prevalent in our day. Mm-hmm. People can say words straight from the Bible right. and not have the authority. I'm, uh, let me just take you back to 1990. Um, I I was praying two hours every morning. I mean, I actually was praying longer than I prayed this morning. Okay, yeah. let's just be honest. Yeah. I'm praying two hours every morning. Yeah. Then I started reading my Bible because I have a whole lot of time because I'm not getting invited to preach. Mm-hmm. Messenger just started. We're talking 1990, right? Nobody's asking me to come preach. Yeah. I'm praying, God, please open doors. And yet doors would open. I would go and preach, and my words were accurate to the Bible, but they weren't carrying power, yeah. authority, yeah. impact. And I started getting really frustrated. I said, God, you've called me to preach. I, I left I left engineering career with, with IBM and Rockwell International. I, I've, I've obeyed you, yet I stand up and preach, and my words just feel like they go boing, 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 boing. Mm-hmm. They just fall to the ground. I said, why is there a stronger anointing on my life? And he said, because you tolerate sin. I went, what? He said, you tolerate sin not only in your own life, but in the lives of others. He said, I want you to read Hebrews 1. So I go over to Hebrews 1. This is the day Jesus raised from the dead. God the Father is inaugurating him as king of the universe. And he makes a statement in verse 9 that's amazing. He said, because you've loved righteousness. He said, stop right there. Every Christian loves righteousness. He said, including you. Right. He said, but that's not all I said. Because you love righteousness and hated lawlessness. Now, what's lawlessness? It's the Greek word anomia, which simply means you're a law unto yourself. So if you look at the garden, you've got these two main figure trees. You've got the tree of life. You've got the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? What do they represent? The tree of life means I trust God as my maker. He knows what breaks me. He knows what makes me, Mm -hmm. right? So let me illustrate that. I'm a dad of four sons. When they're toddlers... Christmas Day is a work day. Every dad listening knows what I'm saying. 
They opened yeah. the gifts, and guess who's building all the toys? Yeah. yeah. Me. Yeah. All right? So I'm your typical dad. What do I do? Break open the box, throw the pieces on the floor, throw the box and the instruction manual over in the corner, and yeah. I build the toy. Yeah. Now, I spend an hour building this toy. I'm finished, but there's still five pieces on the ground. Yeah. I flip the switch, and it doesn't work. What do I do? I go get the instruction manual, the guy that designed the toy. Yeah. I deconstruct it, construct it the way he says do it. Oh, my goodness, there's all the pieces are in now. I hit the switch, and it works. So that's the tree of life. God is perfect love. Yeah. He's awesome. He knows what makes me. He knows what breaks me. Then there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so now let's stop and think about that. That is the tree that I choose what's best for my life outside of what God says. Yeah. So in other words, it doesn't say when she saw the tree was evil. Mm -hmm. It said when she saw, saw it was good. Yeah. So she's not drawn to the evil side. She's drawn to the good side. Yeah. All right? And it's going to make me wise. So it's when we choose what's good for me outside of what God says. Yeah. Lawlessness is that. So, so John writes, and he says, sin is lawlessness. So we, we today say adultery is sin. We say murder is sin. We can go on and on and on. But John says sin is lawlessness. In other words, I'm giving you, John, the Apostle John says, the definition of sin. Adam didn't jump in bed with a prostitute in the garden. Right. He just simply disobeyed what God told him not to do. Right. He chose for himself what was best for his life. All right. That's lawlessness. So let's go back to 1990. Yeah. God says read Hebrews 1. I get to this. Because you've loved righteousness and hated. Now, look at the word hate. Hated lawlessness. Not disliked lawlessness. Right. Not tolerated lawlessness. Right. Not coddled hated lawlessness. It. Because you hate lawlessness. Therefore, God. Now, let's get everybody all, 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 all calm down because you got, you got people who are going, oh my gosh, <laughs> this, is, this is legalism. No, it's not legalism. Right. Let me tell you what the legalist, the legalist says this. I fear God, that's why I hate those sinners. Right. No, that guy doesn't fear God at all. Because the fear of God is to love what he loves and he hate, hate what he hates. That's the fear of God. Okay? So you hate what he loves. Because God loves those, quote, sinners so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for them. Yep. So you actually hate what God loves. What God hates is the sin that unmakes the object of his love. So God hates lawlessness because it unmakes us. Okay. It's like building the toy broken. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's building my life broken. Now, think about it. God's perfect. Perfect in love, perfect in goodness. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, of whom there's no variation or shadow of turning, right? In other words, what is James saying? Don't be deceived. Yeah. There is nothing good for you outside of God's will. Right. So, I don't care how good she looks, how good you think it's going to make you feel, right. how much money you think it's going to make right. me, if it's outside of the will of God, it's going to be bad for you. Right. Now, that makes that makes lawlessness very unattractive, whereas the enemy comes in and makes lawlessness very attractive. So God's sitting there going, you don't hate lawlessness. You, you tolerate it. Oh, my gosh, I saw it, and I repented. Yeah. And I started seeing the anointing of God increase wow. upon my life because listen to what he says. Because you've loved lawlessness and hated Excuse me. Because you, <laughs> gotcha. Let's do this right. Don't worry. <laughs> because you've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Now listen to these next words. Therefore, God, even your God, has anointed you, anointed you beyond your companions. Wow. He said, you learn to hate wow. lawlessness the way I hate lawlessness. You'll see the anointing of God increase upon your life. Okay, so does that tell I'm you why you. you can have people stand up on a platform, preach? Everything's right. Everything's right. accurate. But it's words. Mm. Then you have somebody, they stand up and they speak the word of God, and you're being pierced in your heart. Right. What's the difference? One's anointed beyond his companions. The other one's not anointed beyond right. his companions. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus is the highest anointed of anybody, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but what, what's the goal of God? To make us conform to the image of Jesus, right? Yeah. So I am burdened because I see a generation of a lot of, a lot of excitement, a mm -hmm. lot of passion, a lot of well-meaning young men and women. Yep. But they open their mouths, and their words aren't weighty. Yep. So glory, the glory of God is the weightiness of God. Yep. It carries the authority of God. Yep. So those presences, like what happened in Brazil. Here's all the people. It's a believer's conference. At the beginning of it, they got the best worship team. Yep. Everybody's enjoying the atmosphere because there's no presence of God. 
No, I should, I, th- I'm going to say that. That totally sounds wrong. Everybody's enjoying themselves, and there's no presence of God. It has <laughs> God, believe me, when you have the presence of God, you will enjoy right. yourself. Right. But everybody is, like, not interested. There's no awe. There's no right. awe factor. There's no wonder factor. They're just there. It's another conference. Yeah. And then the word of the Lord comes, addresses their lack of holy fear. Yep. And now all of a sudden, the presence of God comes to where we're terrified, but yet we're all drawn to it. I've had people say to me, my life has never been the same since that wind blew in, in, in Brazil in 1997. I remember a pastor. He, he's a major leader in a major network. He said, I was in the building 20 years ago and when that presence came in. He said, yeah. I've never been the same yeah. since. It, it, that moment, like, and you guys need to read it in the book, but... It's like you thought there was jets flying uh, overhead. The wind blew. I love it. The wind of God blew. I love it. Now, we didn't feel it. Right. Now, there was another meeting I didn't write about in the book that my youngest son came up to me and said, Dad, the wind of God blew in this this meeting. I was preaching on the fear of the Lord again. So, I mean, it is... It... I'm I'm sorry. I'm kind of all over the place. You're fine. But Lisa and I have a book agent, and she is, is very, very good. Yeah. And... She was coming to me like, because I'd preach it to her. Right. She'd be meeting with Lisa, and all of a sudden it'd come out of me, and she goes, you got to write this in a book. And I said, no, I'm not writing it until God tells me. Yeah. Well, in 2022, God spoke to me and said, now write this book, right? So I said to her, I'm writing it. I need you to find the right publisher. Because I knew it was book 24, but I also knew it was my life, my life message. Yeah. I knew that God had been working on me for 30 years on this message. Yeah. And so I, I thought... This thing's got to be done right, and you'll see uh, there's 42 chapters. Yep. Did you also notice that only two of the 42 chapters have more than six pages? They have eight pages. Every chapter has six pages. Because I said to the Lord, I said, nobody's reading. Yeah. They're not reading. Yep. Okay, what do I do? And he said, write really short chapters. And so that was that was difficult. Because I'd be sitting there going, because every chapter is 1,500 words, and I'd be going, Lord... There's so much more to say. Bring it into the next chapter. Do this, do this. And, and, and he gave me the way to do it because now people can, 42 days is six weeks. Yes. Now they can, and there's six sections, seven chapters in each. And you, you, you so the first time I read this, I went through it, right? Mm-hmm. The second time I went through it a lot slower. And you designed this to go slow a chapter a day, yeah. right? And reading it, reading it from start to finish, it's not that book. But what I loved, and this is the first one I've seen, first book that I've seen, do this. You have the practicals, right? What do you, you have? The five P's. Am I, five P's. Yeah. And do you, you want them? Uh, it's yeah. The let me see. Pass I, it. I, yeah. You want to see if you can remember? Me, oh no, I can't. I'm going to butcher it. Just yeah. It's go the for the passage, it. mm-hmm. which is the main passage of that chapter. Mm-hmm. It's the point, the main point of that chapter. It's the ponder. Now this is yeah. the one I love. This is the one I'd spend a lot of time on. Mm-hmm. What what should we be thinking about after what we just read today? The ponder. Then it's the prayer. Then it's the profession. Now you can sit and read this book. In two days, like a normal book, like yeah. some people do. Yeah. You can do that. I remember one time I was with Chris Kane at a conference, and I'd just come out with a brand new book, and she said, yeah, I stayed up last night and read the book. And I was like, I was so mad at her. <laughs> I was like, I spent 400 hours writing this book, and you just right. read it last right. night. You know. But anyway, that's that's another story. Because I, I look with such admiration at people like Chris Kane, my son Addison, yeah. my wife Lisa, who can read a 500-page book in basically a, right. you know five days. But... I wanted to make it to where somebody could read a chapter in seven minutes, nine minutes if they're slow readers, yeah. right? Yeah. And then they can spend as much time in the five Ps as they want. Yeah. And then, I don't know if you know this, but there's a QR code at the end of the book. I saw you it. Do. Yeah. Okay, you do. I saw it. I mean... But so many people have missed this. There's a QR code at the end of the book that has 42 four-minute videos mm-hmm. in it. Those, each of those videos go with each chapter. I wanted somebody to say... I can go as deep in this as yeah. I want, or I can go, you know, as, as quickly as I want. Not only did I find the QR code, I watched a chunk of your videos on YouTube, and they're up on your YouTube channel as well. Right, right. And, and so they're all there, so you can you can watch the videos, go through the book. I got a question. Yep. How has this changed your life? Like, because because you you it. Right. Listen, I've been in ministry for a long time, twenty four years, not nearly as long as you. Whenever you come out with like a line in the sand, you sometimes get couched into that. Like this, you're now the awe of God guy. Do you like that? And number one, number two, how has this changed your ministry or has this changed your ministry in any way? Or are you still the same? These are good questions. So 1990, God said, I've hidden you away. Mm -hmm. 
when he took, gave me this word, he said, and I'm glad he hit me because I prayed something when I was in my 20s that I'm, I've told all four of my sons. I said, I want you to pray this. This is when I was the dumbest, and I prayed one of the wisest prayers I've ever prayed. Okay. And I said, God, never allow this ministry to grow beyond the character you've developed in me. Yeah. All right. So 1990, God speaks to me. He said, I've hidden you away. And now you got to remember, Beta Satan came out in 94. Yeah. But he still hid me away. He said, I'm hiding you away because what I've placed on your life is to preach on the holy awe of God. On, on the, I, I mean, this is one of the main, main no. callings on my life. Okay. So I knew in 1990, this is what, this would be, you know, like John the Baptist trained 30 years for a six-month ministry. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you really stop and think about it, he does. Yeah. Yes, he's preaching probably in the wilderness to his buddies, right. right? Right. But when all of Judea and Galilee came out because he had, what did he have? He had the timely word of the Lord in his mouth for that time. Yeah. And it was, it was only six months because six months later, here comes Jesus. I must decrease. He must increase. Right. I mean, I've asked myself how many, how many times, what are you going to do when God says time to decrease? How are you going to handle that, Bevere? Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. we all should. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because God can put one up and put another down. He's God. Yeah. I mean, we're basically, I'm preaching what I've been preaching for 30 years, and you know what he's done? He's turned the volume up. So what do I do when he turns the volume down? <laughs> I rejoice yeah. because the gospel is going to be preached because he's turned the volume up with something else. Yeah. You know, so this is what he shared with me. He said, out of this, he said, I'm, I'm, I've hidden you away, and when this move comes, I'm going to raise you up as a leader of leaders. And he said, what you're going to do is inspire thousands of young men and women mm. and older men and women. And they're going to go forth. Now, hear, hear, hear this. I, I've never been able to talk about this because nobody draws it out of it. <laughs> you, like, you're drawing it out of me right I now. It's this. crazy. So, all right. John the Baptist was Elijah. Okay. Yeah. He, w- he went forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. Yeah. Okay. Who was he sent to? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. But when they're coming down the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, guys, go read this. Yeah. You'll find it. The apostles, the three that went up there went, okay, whoa, you are the Messiah. Yeah. Okay? Who's Elijah? Because the prophet said Elijah is coming before the Messiah. And Jesus said to him, Elijah is coming. Is coming is future tense. Okay. Okay. Matthew 17, John's dead. Yeah. He was beheaded in Matthew 14. Yeah. Elijah is coming. And Elijah has come already. It talks about two different Elijahs. Right. Okay. So, and, and actually, Malachi says Elijah will come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Yeah. So it's not a person. With John the with John the Baptist, it was a person. Yeah. But that's not the emphasis. Okay. It's the spirit and power of Elijah, which, okay, we're not talking about Elijah, first and second kings. Right. We're talking about in the spirit and power of El Yah, the power and might of Yahweh. Yeah. John went forth in that, and what did he do? Turned the hearts of the fathers back to the children, right? One and, of my favorite verses. Okay, so now, God says to me, there's going to be a multitude. So here's what I really believe the specific of Joel 2 is. Give it to me. Is I believe there's going to be a massive army of young men and women. Yeah. It's going to hit them first. And then men servants and maid servants, older men and women. Yeah. And I believe they're going to be sent to the lost sheep in the church. Now, what do I mean the lost sheep in the church? Barna tells us in the last 24 years, over 30 million people have walked away from the faith in yeah. the United States alone. That's one out of every 10 Americans. Not only have they walked away, they were attending regularly and practicing regularly, and not only that, they now are professed a- atheists, agnostics, and spiritualists. Okay. One, one, one example, a friend of mine, pastor, yep. just a couple weeks ago, I heard him say, and a couple come up to me just recently, they had three sons all yep. called to the ministry. They went to university, and all three are agnostics. Okay. Can I ask a question? Just yep. really quick. Yep. What was their background? You said what what was the what was the denomination they came out of? It was evangelical. Okay. 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 So um <clears throat> we've had literally all these people walk away. Paul said that day will not come until there's a great falling away. Okay. And Thessalonians. What he didn't write is that they wouldn't come back. Yeah. Okay. 
John sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I believe these guys are going to be sent to the lost sheep of the church. And they're going to go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. What they're going to carry is, is the holy awe of God. I believe this. Yeah. Now, what's the one and only description of the church that Jesus is coming back for? It's a holy church without a spot or wrinkle. It's not a leadership church. Yeah. It's not a relevant church. Mm-hmm. It's not a community church. Do I believe in all three? Yeah. yeah. You're never going to have anything accomplished without leadership. It's yeah. a gift from God. Yeah. You're never going to reach the loss if you're not relevant. Yeah. Okay. You're, God himself said it's not good that man's alone. So community is important. 100%. Okay. So I'm not knocking those three. I'm with you. What I'm saying is it's interesting to me the only description of the church Jesus is coming back for is a holy church without a spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Yeah. What's the predominant description of God in the Bible? I mean, John the Apostle goes to the throne, and Isaiah goes to the throne. The angels are not crying love, love, love. Right. Is God love? Yes. He's perfect love. Yeah. Perfect love. They're crying holy. They're crying holy. Yeah. They're not crying faithful. Yeah. He's faithful. Come on. They're crying holy. This is the predominant aspect. And then God comes along and says, be holy as I am holy. Right. Now, we are told to pursue it, mm-hmm. not obtain it. So in other words, when I'm 85 years old, should Jesus tarry, I'm going to be pursuing holiness. Right. That's my pursuit, a behavior that befits my position. He declared me holy in position, mm-hmm. okay? But he tells us to pursue a lifestyle that matches it. Let, let, let's say this. I married Lisa yeah. 42 years ago. She became my wife. She's not more my wife today than she was 42 years right. ago. She won't be more my... Positionally, she's my wife. Right. The day we got saved, God declared us holy. We'll never be more holy. Yep. Never. But what happened when Lisa and I got married? She flirted with guys before we got married. She gave them their phone numbers. She went on dates with other guys. After we got married, she stopped giving her phone number to guys. She stopped going out on dates with guys. She had a behavior that, what, was befitting her position. Mm-hmm. So God, when he says pursue holiness, he's talking about a behavior that befits our position. Chase after that, and he said, because without it, you're not going to see me. Now, what does he mean, see me? Every eye is going to behold him. Jesus is coming in the clouds. He's coming. Even those who pierced him will see him. Every eye is going to see him at the judgment. What is he talking about? I've been under 13 United States presidents. Yeah. Their decisions affect my life. I'm under their rulership, right? I've never seen one. Never been in the presence of a United States president. Right. Okay, there's other Americans that do, but not me. Yeah. There are Christians. They're under the lordship of Jesus. His decisions affect their lives, but they're not seeing him. Yeah. They're not in his presence. Jesus said to him who has my commandments and keeps them, it is him I will love and manifest myself to. How do we keep the commandments of God? Well, just as I wrote in the book, here's the world-famous evangelist sitting looking at me in the federal penitentiary, and he says, this prison was God's mercy on my life. There was wickedness in my life. And I'm, I'm, I'm a young preacher. I'm 35 years old. And I'm like, how do you have the biggest ministry in the world? And you weep as you preach. Right. How are you in this kind of sin? And, he, and I looked at him and I said, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? When? Right. At what point? He goes, I didn't. I, my walls go up. I go, wait a minute. You did all this stuff for seven years. You committed adultery before you were arrested and you were thrown into prison, right? What do you mean you love Jesus? Right. And he said, I loved him all the way through it, John. And he looked at my confusion Ugh. on my face and he goes, I didn't fear God. It's terrifying. <laughs> It's terrifying. It is. It is. I mean, terrifying in a good way. Yeah. It, 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 it really... See, he's, he's the king of the universe. I mean, okay, let's think about it. The most godly man in Israel. He sees the Lord and he cries, woe is me. I'm completely undone. Right. I'm coming apart at the seams. The most godly man. God says this. The most godly man on the planet, Job. Yeah. Godly man. Yeah. Dude, nobody's more godly. Job said, I've heard you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. Yep. I utterly abhor myself. Yep. Abhor means I strongly hate myself. Does it, does it mean he became a masochist? No. He realizes, both Isaiah and Job realize, who this holy God is they're serving. Yeah. Moses, closest man to God in his whole generation, sees the Lord and says, I was exceedingly terrified. Yeah. Okay. John the Apostle, closest person to Jesus, sees Jesus in his glory. His face is like, his countenance is like the sun. And falls down when he sees him like a dead man. Yeah. So what are we de- dealing with here? God in Isaiah 45 verse 15 says, I am a God who hides myself. Mm. What is, why does he hide himself? 
to see if we're going to see his glory in our hearts or if we're going to be enamored by the talented movie stars, the great athletes we have, all the stuff we're getting on our phones. Yeah. If that's going to be what we get in off example, I, I'm sorry. I, I feel you're like fine. I'm dominating. You're, no, no, no. You're fine. I have only a uh, hundred thousand questions for okay, you. Okay, we're, we're going to keep but no, going. You're, we're you're good. Keep, okay, so I, I'm going to honor whatever needs whenever you need to roll. So, my boys. Yeah, they're twelve down to about four. <laughs> I think it was right in that age range. Maybe it was they were a little younger. All I'm hearing about is Michael Jordan. Right. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Mike. Now I'm an athlete. I played D1 tennis at Purdue University. Okay? okay. I played USTA circuit. I played Junior Davis Cup. Athletics has been a part of my life. Right. But I was so fed up. I was so fed up with hearing about Michael Jordan. And I still believe he's the best basketball player ever. I don't care if LeBron got 40,000 points. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Michael came through at clutch times. He's okay. the king. He's, he's it. He's the GOAT. I'm basketball. Okay? <laughs> and, and so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not dissing Michael. Yep. Okay, I'm actually friends with his mother. Okay, that's a whole, another whole story. Dolores, a beautiful woman, a woman of God. Let's anyway, go um, I was just fed up. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> And I remember I'm preaching on the East Coast. The Atlantic Ocean is just like all churned up. It's yep. it, The waves are massive. They're body surfing. They're getting slammed. They got sand in their mouth, their hair, their suits. And they're done. And we go up to the room and I thought, this is, this is the, my moment. This is the, my moment to have a dad talk. So I open up the sliding door. They all get on the bed. They got the towels wrapped around them. This is in the appendix, by the way, in the okay. book. I don't know if you read it. I have not. So, so they all got their towels around them. And I say, boys, time for a dad talk. They say, okay, great. I said, I, I, I said it's a pretty powerful ocean out there, isn't it? Yeah. I'm like, oh, my gosh, dad. Yeah, yeah. I said, yeah. You know, if a meteor came down, you know, you know what would happen? If it was just 100 miles out, it would wipe right. out the entire East Coast. That's how powerful that ocean is. I said, pretty big, pretty, pretty, pretty big ocean, isn't it? Go, oh, dad, it's huge. I said, you can only see one mile out there. I said, it goes another 4,000 miles. There's another one on the other side called Pacific that's bigger. There's two others beside. I said, you know that the Bible says that God weighed every drop of that water in the palm of his hands? And I said, now, you're impressed with a guy can jump from 15 feet with a ball, palming <laughs> a ball, putting it through a little hole. Yeah. They went, whoa yeah. and i said god palmed every bit of that water wow and they said we get it yeah so you know what happened michael came back to proper perspective he's a good athlete right he won the championship great yeah. big deal everybody will forget about it someday now they understand the guy that palmed all the water on the planet right so what did i do i got him in touch with the glory that's revealed in the face of jesus christ and we have this treasure in our hearts so God says, are you going to get enamored by what's out here that mm. has no glory in comparison to me? Or are you going to see my glory in my hearts? Because I hide my glory, and I'm, I hide it on purpose to see what you're going to go after. Yeah. You, was it you? Forgive me. Oh, I didn't no, look this up ahead of time. I think it was you that had a video of like the galaxies and moving outward now. Is no, that, that was that was Louis Giglio. Oh, never mind. Whatever. Ign back. I'm going to ignore that. But as you're sharing, that thing's coming back to my memory. Uh, sure. In in your writing, in your messages, you are what I, one of the things I really appreciate cuz I'm more off the cuff. I love how your stream, your tribe, which I know we're the same, but I love how you guys can pack so much into such a tight space and you it seems like to me you really enjoy researching all these little details and the Barna stuff. Like, and so in another book I write about, um, <laughs> it's, you know, the heavens declare his greatness, his glory. Yeah. Right. So, so I sat down with my boys when they were old enough to understand this, and this may blow your listeners away, and, but I'm going to do it anyway. Go for it. So the sun is basically uh, 93 million miles away from the earth, right? Takes light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per 282 miles per second. That's roughly 540 million miles per hour. Takes light eight minutes and 19 seconds to get to the earth. Yeah. If I get on a plane and I go nonstop, nonstop. Yeah. Okay. I fly around the world all the time. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. You know, you've done it. Delta Heidi's done United. It, right? I just oh, need yeah. to know which one. Uh, uh, United. God, get out. No, of here. I'm I know. Done. I'm, I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm switching. I'm, We're I'm done here. I, my favorite airlines, Delta, yes. of the American carriers. Okay, Come so on. let. I'm let, sorry. There we it's go. So there far we go. away, you got to fly long. Yeah. I mean, I remember. Uh, you know, Lisa. Lisa's been global with United for yeah. nine years, and I remember one year I was global with United, and I flew 227 thousand miles on Emirates that year, yeah. as well as global. But anyway, I'm sorry. I, so anyway, I, you, you, it, it would take us. So so. It would take us 
oh gosh, what's what's the figure? Um, oh, it's it's about twenty years to fly nonstop, nonstop to the sun. Twenty years. Okay. Okay. Now, let's talk about the closest star to the Earth, Alpha Centauri. It's four point three light years away. Four point three. What's a light year? How far light travels in one year? Okay. Now let's let's simplify this. Everybody listen to me. Don't don't turn me off yet. <laughs> Let's make the sun the size of a soccer ball. Okay. The earth in comparison would be the size of a peppercorn. Okay. If we do it to scale, we got to put the sun down and 26 yards away, we put the peppercorn. That's, that's perfect yeah. scale. Do you know where the closest star would be? No. I have no idea. 4,000 miles away. Okay. That's... That, that means if we put our soccer ball in New York City and we put the peppercorn 26 yards away, the nearest star to us would be 1,000 miles past Los Angeles. My God. Okay, now, that's the closest star, and that's only 4.3 light years away. Yeah. Okay, now, most stars we see at night are in our small galaxy, and they're between 100 and 1,000 light years away, which means it takes 1,000 years. Right. Light traveling to get to the Earth. There are a couple of stars in our galaxy, our little tiny galaxy, yeah. that are 4,000 light years away. What does that mean? It means my head hurts. That means that light left that star about the time Sarah and Abraham got married. Wow. It's been traveling 600, 540 million miles per hour, and it's just getting here tonight. That's in our small galaxy. Right. And that's 4,000 light years away. Now, our galaxy's got about a billion stars, the next nearest galaxy is called Andromeda. It's 2.3 million light years away from us. John, I failed high school. Okay, so no, 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 stay I'm with me. So, I'm, with I'm almost you. done. I'm with you. <laughs> okay, 2.3 million light years away. Yep. Got it? Yep. The Hubble Space Telescope has now discovered galaxies that are 13 billion light years away from us. Okay, now let's go back to the four. Yeah. Point three. Can you even imagine trying to fly yeah. to any of that? It's, it's okay, so he measures every bit of this with the span of his hand. Gosh. Okay, he, Isaiah said it. You measured the universe with the span. That is from your thumb to your pinky. Wow. Okay, so when I look at the stars, yep. what are you that you even think about us? Right. So now God hides this to see what we're going to... A guy... Jumping from 15 foot and putting the ball through the hole? <laughs> yeah. that, does that bring it, it back into perspective? perspective? I mean, the universe can't even contain right. you. The Bible right. says it can't even contain them. Right. All right? So this is why the most godly men are crying out, woe is me. Yeah. I'm undone. It, I'm Beautiful. It's, this is beautiful. I'm not, I, I, I can't, I can't even, that's such a beautiful perspective on this. So does that cause you to go awe? It, in, in it awe? does. Yes. Yeah. It does. No, yeah. and, it, and if it doesn't, you have, you're dead in your heart. Like, you're, it you're can't, you can't know him and not be in awe right. of the infinite, just impossibilities of God. I, I so admire, I, and maybe it's just your degree, maybe it's just your background, but the, the mathematics, I admire it all. It, it takes the impossible and really makes it tangible, puts it in perspective. I got two things I want to ask you, and then I know sure. I know you gotta I know you gotta go. Oh, this is okay. fun. I, know. Uh, I can be a little late. I can uh, losing salvation. You want to hit that in the no. middle of all this? Okay, yes, we won't we won't no. talk about it. Okay, the don't reason, worry. The reason the reason I want to cover it is I would want to do an entire podcast I, on it. I totally agree. before I answer that. So don't go there assuming where I'm at. Just leave it. No, there. that was a question of of I don't know. It's something I'm studying right now. Okay. Personally, so I really want to write some about of your, it. Your if, 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 you, if, if you've got an interest, I write about an entire chapter in Driven by Eternity. Okay, I knew I had to address it. Yeah. Now, I have pastor friends of massive churches mm -hmm. that look at me and go, You and I don't agree on this. Yep, I said, I know. And they said, We know that you respect us enough that if we have you come, you're not going to preach on this. I yeah. said, There's so much more to preach about than of that. Of course. To be honest with you, I felt like I couldn't write Driven by Eternity and not address that question. That's why I went to pull it out because I said, you know, I don't want to lose people over this controversy. But I realized when I read it, because we, we, I wrote Driven by Eternity in 2006. And by the way, yep. two books that have changed me personally, yep. Driven by Eternity and Awe of God. Yep. So Driven by Eternity, 
we relaunched it in 2016, and that is the fourth, third, third or fourth best selling book that I've written. Yeah, I think everybody needs an internal perspective because it's it. an elementary doctrine of Christ. But anyway, that's another story. I do answer it in that chapter, and if your listeners want to go get that book, yep, because I don't want to open up that can of worms and not really talk it through. We won't, but we'll save it for another time. Next okay. thing, grace. Yes. Okay. Uh, as I'm reading I'll the talk about God, that, I know you do, but <laughs> oh, it's uh, we we're just gonna have to do this again sometime, and and you better. That's a that's a that's a promise. He just he yep he fist bumped me. That's it. He agreed. <laughs> it's agreed. It's on camera. Uh, I'm grace. Yep. At, as I was as I was reading, I was just I was just going, man. People, we've undersold it. We have. Okay, so that's that that's the easiest way to explain it. We've undersold grace. Does grace save us? Yes. Mm -hmm. Only by grace. Yes. We're yes. saved only by grace. Yes. We're 100% we're saved only by grace. Is grace a free gift? 100% yes. it's a free gift. Is grace forgive our sins? 100%. Okay. Here's where we stopped. Grace is God's empowerment that gives us the ability to do what truth demands of us. Yes. That's grace. So God himself defined grace as his power. Yep. He said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you for my power works best in your weakness, my human inability, okay? Yep. So the grace of God, yes, we've preached it correctly, but we've left out. If you look at Paul, he says, he says this, if anybody suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Yeah. It's not my fault. Yeah. Because I didn't shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So I believe what's getting us in trouble right now is not what we're saying about grace. It's what we're not saying about grace. Yeah. Okay? We are leaving, leaving out a major element, and that major element is that grace empowers me to live a holy life. Right. I couldn't live holy in my own ability. Right. Now, if I don't tell people that, they don't now don't have the faith to receive that grace to live that overcoming life. Yeah. If all I'm told is grace is my salvation, yep. it forgives me my sins, and it's a free gift, I don't have the faith now to live beyond my ability yeah i tried to live holy i couldn't yep grace empowered me to live holy mm -hmm. okay now i got when i understand that the grace is god's empowerment because that's what peter said grace be multiplied to you as his divine power is given to us everything we need to live a godly life yep. we need grace's empowerment to, to live a godly life yeah now here's the sad thing two percent of americans understand that grace is god's empowerment that was after a massive thir survey of over five thousand people okay so they all said it's god's empower they all said i mean all of them said it was god's salvation they all said it was a free gift many of them said it was the love of god and most of them said it was forgiveness of sins. 2% said it was God's empowerment. So this is what this tells me. 98% of the Christians in America are trying to live godly in their own ability. Yeah. You know what happens when you try to do that? You fall flat on your face. Yeah. yeah. And now you can't live an overcoming life. Yeah. So we have done a disservice thinking we were bringing people into bondage. Mm -hmm. We were actually... We're bringing people into bondage by not telling them you have the power in you to live a godly life. Yep. It's not your ability, it's his, and it's called grace. Yeah. I was raised in a domination that we were told not to read the Bible, that our priest had to interpret the Bible, yep. right? So I get saved, I'm all excited. I took an extension course at Purdue University from Notre Dame, yep. and I found out that 75% of our doctrine came from men. I said, whoa, 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 what, what, really? He said, yeah, 25% Pope, 25% Ecumenical Council, 25%, uh, excuse me, 50% Ecumenical Council, 25% Pope, and 25% Bible. And I went, huh? I said, I'm basing my eternal, where I'm going for eternity, my relationship with God, I'm basing off of 75% of what men say. Yep. And I remember in that class, I said to myself, I will never, ever, ever, ever again discount any scripture I read. I will believe it whether I understand it or not. Come on. Now that it, I didn't realize it. That's the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Some of the hardest scriptures to understand, God has given me the greatest revelation because I said, I believe it before I understood it. Yeah. Now that's the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord says, okay, I'm not God. So my understanding, my human understanding yeah. doesn't get this right now. Yeah. But he never would have allowed this because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Yeah, you could pull a Scripture out of somewhere and make up a doctrine. It's the counsel of Scripture, the mm -hmm. whole counsel. 
And you can't pull out four books in the Bible. Right. And say... You can't. Scripture interprets scripture. Yep. And man, taking an axiom, taking a lens by man, I think has been a lot of the downfall, a lot of why people get these funky doctrines and why, as much as I love them, I, I equally love Luther. I equally love Ar- Arminius. Like I, 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 I love them all, but man, it's very, uh, this is just the journey that I'm on and I might change my mind in a year from now. It's so dangerous to take a man's view of scripture. It is. And go, this is exactly what it means. It is. It, it, outside of... you got to be a Berean. You have you to. you got to study the scriptures. Yeah. They were they were wiser than the ones at Thessalonica because they studied the scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And it was true. Yep. Now, the only way you're not going to find out it's true is if your heart's not right. Jesus said the people right. that have their hearts right with right. God will know that what I speak is from right. God. Right. Okay? So it's like, what do you do with all the people that get upset with you, John, and all this? I'm like... One of two things. Either I didn't explain it right, right, and I didn't give it the way God gave it to me. Or number two, I may not have a heart for God. Wow. So let me, let me attack something. You th- go th- for th- it, please. Because I want to I address this one. Okay. You got all these people that are all angry because women are preaching. So, you know, my wife, the hand of God's honor, yep. I, told, I told her years ago, I said, you, you're going to preach. And she was mad at me for having to do it. I mean, she, she was so mad at me for a week. I said, no, this is back when I was a youth pastor in the early 1980s. There is so much in you, you got to preach it to our youth group. And she's like, oh, all right, right, right. So finally, one day, God comes into her room and says, Lisa, I've called you to preach, you know, mm-hmm. basically. And, and she wept and wept. And I, I walked in. And I said, what happened? She's like, John, I know I'm called to preach, especially to women. I said, okay, good. Now I don't have to be me anymore. God's done it. But... <laughs> She shows me the comments she gets by these people that, yeah. like, this is the worst sin that a woman can preach from a pulpit. And I'm like, what? So I, I was wrestling with this. And, 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 and I noticed that the, the Pharisees, you know what they did? They watched Jesus and his disciples to find fault. Yeah. That, that was their motive. Yeah. Okay, we're going to watch to find fault. So... Yeah, you got three scriptures that Paul writes. All three scriptures go to a Greek culture. Timothy's yep. pastoring and Ephesus, and you've got the Corinthians. Okay, they elevated women a little bit, right? Okay. So I'm constantly saying to my wife, she's like, oh gosh. I said, yeah, but God said your sons and daughters will preach, right? And she's like, why does it appear that they conflict? And I said, it's because the Greek culture's elevated goddesses, okay? Yeah. And the women, the way, you, you know, and I'm like, Paul's a dealing with it, right? Well, still people didn't go for that. Yep. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So she brings me this 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 post. She she was sharing something and 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 this woman goes, The greatest sin is a woman preaching the gospel. My God. And I'm like, but the, the, I said, Lisa, I said, Lisa, I said, Lisa, why do you even listen to that? Yeah. I said, That's a that's a Pharisee. And she was like, Whoa. And I said, wait a minute. And it was like right there the Spirit of God revealed to me. Let's go to Philippians. Paul's in jail. And he said, there are people that are preaching the gospel to add to my affliction. Mm -hmm. He said, whether they're doing this out of right motives or wrong motives, I praise God because the gospel's being preached. I said, Lisa, the Pharisees are watching for one little fault as far as the written Mm -hmm. law. Yep. Why don't these people have the heart that Paul has? I, I know it's a woman preaching, but praise God, the gospel's being preached. Yeah. They've got the critical eye of a Pharisee yeah. who's saying, no, you're a female, you can't be speaking. Yeah. So I, I just feel like when you, when, you, when you walk in the holy fear of God, all of a sudden the Bible be- comes together. Yeah. It's, it's the beginning of understanding. Yeah. And I look at these dear, dear people, and I don't mean to call them Pharisees, and, and I was being a little frustrated in the moment. But do you want to have that kind of motivation? Do you want to find fault? Yeah. When in reality, the, the bigger picture is the gospel right. is being preached. The bigger right. picture says your sons and daughters will prophesy. Right. So it's, it's an insanity. interesting day we're living in. It is. And, you know, everybody has their own opinion and they have their own platform just like this. The same thing that allows us to do this is the same thing that allows everybody else to do what they're doing. But I, I, uh, I hear you and I, I couldn't imagine being a husband and having those sort of comments 
after my wife. I, I don't know the battle that you must go through or have gone through. You definitely have to walk in fear of the Lord because there's stuff that's come after me, stuff that's come after Heidi, and I find it to be repulsive at best, and I don't see the Spirit of the Lord in it. But uh, that's me. I Help, won't put any of that on you. Just pray and just say, Lord, give me Paul's attitude. Yeah. You know, in one sense, he says, praise God, Jesus is being preached because he's being afflicted. Yeah. Then in another incident where families were being hurt, he said, I wish they'd be uh, cut off. Yeah. You know what he was saying, don't you? Yeah. I wish that they would be neutered. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually what he wrote. And you're like, whoa, because he was so angry because families and people and lives are being destroyed. They were being pulled away from the true faith and back into legalism. Yep. And Paul was so angry about it. Yeah. So when it, it dealt with him, he was like, praise God, Jesus is being preached. I'm getting beat some more in prison. He's being preached. Right. I mean, that's right. that's the attitude we need to have. Right. If it's me personally, praise God, Jesus is being preached, right? Yep. It's me, my wife being, praise God, Jesus is being preached. When you start talking about families or you know, walking away from the faith or going yeah. headlong into sin because you haven't preached the grace empowers us to live godly or you refuse to preach on holiness. Now I'm going to get a little bit more outspoken about it because yeah. this isn't about me. This yeah. is about the body of Christ. Come on. 30-second answer, last question. Yeah. Okay? A lot of what you tackle in here is is a, a legalistic or a twisted approach on what fear is. And I think uh, I've seen a lot of... Well, you, what I hear you saying is you, you're seeing a lot of deconstruction. You're seeing a lot of people leave. There's a lot of that going on right now. And I think at the root, it, it is the legalism, right? Mm-hmm. They've been told, are you saved? Are you not? You don't know. Are you chosen? Like, I think there's a lot of stuff behind what I see in the deconstruction and people leaving church. And it's rooted, I think, I think a lot of it's taught. It's taught to our children as a father of four boys, as a grandfather, as somebody who's traveled the globe and ministered, carries this message. What would you say to a mom and dad? that's trying to live in the chaos of, of the way the world is right now. Right. Raise their kids in the fear of the Lord, but don't want to push them to where they start having an unhealthy view of God. Like, how Can you give any wisdom on navigating that with kids? 30 seconds, I, if you I want. A longer, <laughs> um, I was a youth pastor before I was a dad. Yeah. And that was one of the greatest blessings because I did all the counseling. And quite honestly... The families that refused to discipline their children were in my office constantly. Yeah. The families that disciplined and loved their children, they were never in my office. Wow. And the pa- parents that disciplined their children, mm. their children grew up staying on course. The families that didn't discipline, their children went awry. Wow. I've seen it over and over and over and over. And I remember I, I said, take note. I mean, I don't always see it in Scripture. He who spares the rod hates his son. Yeah. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive him far from him. I said, I see it in Scripture, and I see it in my office. Yeah, I'd be a fool right now right. To, to take on this, this um, mentality that I'm going to love my child out of his rebellion. Mm-hmm. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. you got to drive it out. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of my sons, the, the funny one, he's, he's the comedic of the four. Somebody said, how, how did your parents get four sons that work? They've all worked for us for at least nine years. Now, two of them, two of them are on different roads, and I'm delighted about these. Um, but they said, they said to him, how did your parents end up? And this was his answer. He said, spankings and games. Yeah. In other words, they 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 engaged with us. Yep. They played games. And in the games, we would talk about the things of God. And then the other thing I add is saying I'm sorry. Yeah. I, 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 I've I never met a parent other than God himself that it doesn't make mistakes. Yeah. So the question is, are you going to say I was wrong right. and I'm sorry? So good. What our boys later told us, they said, Dad, you always did it. We felt safe. Mm. So in this chaotic world, believe me, your words carry greater weight than this, our society. Yeah. And I would say praying for your children, because I would cry out to God, Ephesians 1, Colossians you know, 1. Yeah. I would cry out to God, 
that they be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Yeah. They walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. We know this, yeah. right? I'd pray it, and then I'd, I would discipline. Yeah. Lisa and I would discipline. Yeah. And we would say, I'm sorry. And we would engage with them. I would say those those things. And the other thing I did is I always brought them into ownership of our ministry. Yeah. I said, do you, I, one day I asked them, I said, do you see us as being taken away from you? Or do you see it as your part in sowing the lives of countless others? And they said, oh, we see it as our part of the ministry. I said, good, just for that attitude, every soul we touch, you're going to get on. credit for it at the judgment seat. If you had the attitude that we were being taken from you, you wouldn't get credit for any of it. I love it. And they were like, whoa. So that's what I would say to parents um, today. Come on, John. This is Thank a pleasure. So. I, Thank you. I, please. Thank you for... Just drawing things out. I, I love that. I didn't even begin. Normally, I'll do like hours and hours because I love going deep, but I know your time is limited. Please give my thanks to uh, Lisa, uh, your incredible wife. I will. Who my wife is addicted to, by the way. <laughs> and uh, and if she wants to come on here anytime, I would love I would to. I will tell have, her. I will have my she wife have a come blast. in. Oh, well, my Well, she's goodness. writing a book called Fight for F- The Fight for Female. Okay. It comes out in September. So can you contact us? And because 100%. I'd love to see Lisa on talking about that because she's addressing the hard issues. Um, 100%. We're saying the trans issues, all that yep. fun stuff. She's address, addressing it with the scripture head on in a very godly and a motherly way. I love it. Yeah. We will definitely have her on. Guys, I want you to get this. Uh, it is called The Awe of God, and it's incredible. Uh, go to it. Amazon. Go to Amazon. Where do you want people? You don't website Amazon. Look, where do you want? If they go to my website, they got to enter their credit card. They got to enter their address. They got to enter all that. I know they're all Prime members if they're in the United States. Yes. All you got to do is click one button, and it's a twenty nine dollar book. It's on sale at Amazon right now. Now I, I know podcasts are yes. listening too much later. Right now it's on sale for fifteen dollars. Come on, on Amazon fifteen some odd cents. So, <laughs> gosh, go to Amazon. Jeff Bezos gets the money, not us, but I don't care because it's all going to burn up the money. I just want them to get the message. And there's also a workbook that goes with this book yep. for group study or individual study, and it's a black cover that looks exactly the same. It's on Amazon as well. So, guys, get it. How, if they want to follow you, website, what's your website? Okay, so johnbevere.com, and then we also have a $14 million app that we built that's totally free. It's in 127 languages. It's called Messenger X. So if, if people are listening, let's say they're in a nation where they speak Turk or they speak uh, Lisu or they speak uh, Javanese, mm-hmm. there are going to be books and courses in their languages in 127 languages. So it's the number one app in the world uh, in languages. YouTube's number six in the world at 80. We're at 129. We just went from 127 to 29 just recently. So... Yeah. That's mind-boggling. So so you just go to the App Store, type in Messenger X, no okay. space between the R and the X, or you go to Google Play if you got an Android, type in Messenger X, or if you just got a computer, which is okay, MessengerX.com. Come on. And that will get you in. And like I said, it's a $14 million app. It's developed by one of the best app makers in the world, and it's free. I love it. Uh, John, we're going to put all that stuff in the in the description below. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. So good to hang Such out with pleasure. you. Such a pleasure. Bless you, sir. I'm having coffee with your son on Wednesday. Oh, you and, are? Yeah, yeah. Addison? Yeah. Of course. He's such an amazing man. Yeah, he is. And I love that. I, I can see where he, where he gets it from. Guys, hit like, hit subscribe, and uh, share a comment because that helps. It helps. So do that, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the uh, Irish Global Green Room. Bless you guys. That was fun.